is a great privilege to introduce one such scientist to you today. Dr. Colin McGuckin, an Irish man originally from Ballymead in County Antrim, is doing amazing things with adult stem cells. Incredible, amazing things. It literally boggles my mind. In 2006, his team made medical history when they grew a mini liver from umbilical cord blood stem cells. The exciting news is that this breakthrough will one day provide entire organs for transplant. <coughs> Dr. McGuckin now heads up the prestigious Cell Therapy Research Institute in Lyon, which is one of the world's largest adult stem cell centers. And his research indicates that cord blood has an amazing capacity to develop into a wide range of human tissues, and that hopefully these will have a huge impact. This research will, hope, will have a huge impact not only on treating human disease but also in providing human tissues for drug development and testing. And Dr. McGuckin has sound pro-life principles. And they became very publicly evident when he made headlines because he moved his clinic to Lyon from the UK, saying that their focus on embryonic stem cell research in Britain was failing patients. And I think that deserves our respect and it deserves our heartiest congratulations. working with TV, radio, and print media, and he believes in promoting medical and scientific research understanding to the public. I'm absolutely delighted to have him here today to share his huge intellect, his expertise, his knowledge, and his vision with the Viva La Vida Pro Life Conference. So please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in giving a huge welcome to Dr. Colin <laughs> Stem cells are not the whole answer. In the future, I believe there will be three pillars of healthcare. There will be drugs, surgery, and stem cells. And sometimes these will be used separately, and sometimes they will be used together. And of course, in the future, in order to have a good therapy, we have to combine these all together. 
So stem cells are not the medical human holy grail. We have to do other things as well, and that must be remembered. Now, in terms of adult stem cell sources, we have three main uh, sources, cord and cord blood from the umbilical cord. We have bone marrow. We also have adipose fat-related tissues. And all of these have a role to play right now in our clinics. The first use of cord blood, in fact, was a very long time ago. It was a Palestinian doctor called Halbrecht who thought it might be a good idea to keep cord blood and potentially use it for adult-to-adult -adult blood transfusions. Now, as we know, it's much easier to do an adult to an adult blood transfusion from one of you to one of you. So it never really took off. And so it was a long time before people started to think about other types of stem cell therapies. However, in the 1950s, leading to a Nobel Prize, which demonstrates to you how long stem cells have been really around. The 1950s, we realized that we could take bone marrow stem cells from one person and put them into another person to help restock the bone marrow after chemotherapy or radiotherapy for someone who has leukemia, and now many other diseases. The first recorded use of an umbilical cord blood transplant for the same thing for children with leukemia was first reported in 1970 by two enterprising doctors in America called Enda and Enda, one of whom is in his 90s and still alive in California. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but it started to sort of tell us that one day cord blood would be useful. And this started a long development of cord blood towards the clinic. Finally, in 1988, it was achieved in France, and now 20,000 people have already been successfully treated with umbilical cord blood stem cell transplantations. Our work, well, some people ask me why uh, I'm interested in stem cells, and when I first left Ireland at the age of 24, I went off to work in London, in a hospital in South London, and I started to work on children like Luke. And Luke had a very serious blood disorder, bone marrow disorder, called diamond black anemia. And basically what happens to children like Luke, a couple of weeks after birth, their red blood cells stop growing. And then a couple of months after that, their white cells stop growing. And then for the rest of their short life, they have blood transfusions and sometimes you have steroid therapies. And we started to develop a treatment for these children to see if we could actually help them. We looked at replacing their bone marrow, and then eventually we looked at using cord blood. And up until this stage, the average age of these children was lucky to be in their teenage years before they unfortunately died. Now, it was very easy to tell when Luke was born that he was not like other children. He was, in fact, born without a thumb. And what they actually had to do was to insert an incision here and move his little pinky finger around and actually allow him to be able to then pick things up. Now the future for children like Luke was always pretty bleak. But when we started to realize we could use cord blood, the future became a lot brighter. And for that reason, we started to work on these children. Now this is how normal bone marrow stem cells grow from a normal child. And this is a child like Luke. You can see the capacity and the ability to grow just isn't as good. So by replacing the bone marrow in these children and actually putting something new in, we had a, a way to recover the abnormality and help them to grow red blood cells again. So this led to a very long-term strategy where we could actually isolate and process uh, umbilical cord blood and adult stem cells to then expand them up without animal products, which is very important, because you really don't want to inject animal products into you if you can avoid it. And then to differentiate and turn them into different tissues, such as nervous tissue, liver tissue, pancreas tissue, and blood vessel-related tissues, and these are all pictures from my laboratory. And then to turn them into a final product, which could be used for two main applications. For clinical applications for treating children with serious disease, and second of all, for drug screening. Now, we believe that if we can create a lump of liver tissue in the laboratory, we can use that liver tissue to test drugs on. This will develop much better humanized drugs than testing on animals. It will reduce the number of animals that we slaughter every year, needlessly trying to make drugs. And it will make much better humanized drugs, which will work better on you. And this is another area of stem cell research that needs to be found. Now, 
we were working in this area long before people even called these things stem cells, and it's always been amazing to me how the hype in the last five to ten years has really taken off. And when in the uh, early 1999, 2000 area, we started to develop a very unusual technique, and it was to produce cells which are very, very similar to embryonic stem cells, but from human umbilical cord blood. And when we published the paper finally in 2004, we were largely attacked by the embryonic stem cell researchers across the world because we had dared to step into their territory. We had dared to say for the first time, well, actually, we don't need embryonic stem cells. And I had never really believed that we did need them since embryonic stem cells had largely been something that was done on mice. And it was only when they started to try to do it on humans that they started to really have a lot of hype and uh, media attention. But we produced these. And we call them cord blood derived embryonic light cells because they grew in an almost identical way to human embryonic stem cells. And we could grow many, many different tissues from those embryonic stem cells from cord blood, but without touching an embryo. And this, along with other types of stem cell research, such as IPS induced pluripotent stem cells and bone marrow stem cells and fat related stem cells, showed us that there are quick routes into the hospital clinics with stem cells without using human embryos. Woo! Now, uh, of course, many of them told us we were mad. <laughs> um, that happens to me quite a lot. And many of them said that uh, it wasn't possible and that I had lied. So, in the Nature Journal, which is very famous, we published the entire A to Z protocol of how to do it. Which I thought was kind of great, because normally scientists don't like to give away their techniques, they like to keep their secrets, and, uh, but we decided to share them with humanity and dare them to do it themselves. So, after that they got really mad, <laughs> because we had shown them how to do it. And um, it, was a, it was really interesting, a couple of years. So what can we do with umbilical cord blood? Let me show you some of the things we actually do. Who are we treating? Well, there's two issues here. You can treat you with your stem cells, sometimes, and you can treat you with somebody else's stem cells, sometimes. But this is a big debate going on in human therapies. Which stem cells should you use, and from whom? But the answer to this is very simple. You have to use the right stem cells at the right time and for the right person, and for the right disease. So for this reason, we're trying to look at disease-specific situations and choose the right thing. Now, this is what a cord looks like. This is drawn by one of my students. This, you've got the arteries going through the umbilical cord, and you've got the jelly that holds the whole cord together. And you can get lots of different interesting cells from the umbilical cord. You can get the cord blood, which contains stem cells. You can take the jelly and produce another type of stringy stem cells called mesenchymal. And you can even take the area at the edge of the veins and get vascular endothelial cells. And each of these is finding a route into the clinic right now. It's not um, science fiction, it's actually happening. So in our group, we're using cord blood to replace the bone marrow, particularly of children after cancer, after things like leukemia.